On June 30th, 1989, the biopic Great Balls of Fire was released in theaters. Reviews were mixed, with some accusing the movie of romanticizing child sexual abuse and the other shadier aspects of the main character's life. Of course, with biopics, historical accuracy is almost always a mixed bag. Y'all might know this already, but this is why I tend to be cold toward biopics. They dramatize and romanticize flawed people and try to make them look iconic. Bohemian Rhapsody is a classic example of the inaccurate biopic. I know I'm biased here because I hate Brian May with every bone in my body, but the way the movie is presented screams, look at how cool and glamorous and epic Freddy was who woo by Queen CD. Never mind that Paul Printer wasn't a soulless monster who introduced Freddy to drugs, and that Queen wasn't immediately on top of the world, and that the film proper is somewhat homophobic. It's a well-known fact that Brian May and Roger Taylor, Queen's two surviving members, prefer profitability to personal dignity, and in Bohemian Rhapsody, it shows. But in Great Balls of Fire, I think there's a modern message that can be learned. There's something special under the pomp and circumstance of the film, and I want to dissect it with a 2021 lens to see how it was ahead of its time. But first, of course, my disclaimers! Number one, do not harass anyone I mentioned in this video, please and thank you. Number two, in this video, I'm not going to go into the historical inaccuracies because that's not what I'm here for. If you're just here for that, get the fuck out! Number three, I know that looking at a 1989 film through a modern viewpoint can seem pompous and an all-around terrible idea. But stick around, I promise I'll make this worth your while. Now, on with the show! You shake my nerves and you rattle right my brain You know you love to have a man sane You broke my wind, what a thrill Could it be raised and quit balls of fire The subject of Great Balls of Fire is American rock and roll musician Jerry Lee Lewis. So let's go over his life before we get to the film. Jerry Lee Lewis was born on September 29, 1935 in Faraday, Louisiana, a small town close to the Louisiana-Mississippi border. He taught himself to play piano, which would become his signature instrument, and took inspiration from blues, gospel, and country. He started performing publicly at 14, but it took until 1956 for him to be signed by Sun Records in Memphis, Tennessee. This was a big deal, as Sun Records also signed talent like Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash. That same year, Jerry Lee recorded his first single, but his soloist career really took off in 1957, with hits such as Whole Lot of Shakin' Going On, You Win Again, and of course, Great Balls of Fire. In fact, his career took off to such an extent that many thought he would surpass Elvis in popularity and become the true king of rock and roll. He didn't. Why? In 1958, it was revealed that Jerry Lee married a girl named Myra Gale Brown the year prior. Why was this an issue? Myra was his cousin once removed. His 13-year-old cousin once removed. This killed his career for almost a decade, as people refused to play his songs on the radio or book him for performances. Jerry Lee's luck changed in 1968 when he found success recording country music. He and Myra divorced in 1970, and he still records and performs to this day. In the 1980s, Myra wrote a tell-all book with rock journalist Murray Silver titled Great Balls of Fire, The Uncensored Story of Jerry Lee Lewis. It alleged that Jerry Lee was an alcoholic drug addict that subjected Myra to every type of physical and mental abuse imaginable. 
She seems to have backtracked since then, disowning the book and writing a new one in 2016 about her marriage to Jerry Lee. I have not read it. It's irrelevant to the video. I'm sorry. Soon enough, Orion Pictures, known for such hits as Arthur, Amadeus, and a lot of Woody Allen's directing work, ew, bought the film rights to the 80s book, but decided to not involve Myra with its production for reasons. They brought in Winona Ryder to play Myra and then A-lister Dennis Quaid to play Jerry Lee himself. Fun fact, Quaid coincidentally went to the same high school as me. Sadly, the film bombed and most forgot of its existence. But not me! I remember so you don't have to! Let's look at the modern lesson you can learn from this movie. Unsurprisingly, Great Balls of Fire focuses on the relationship between Jerry Lee Lewis and Myra Gale Brown. The relationship dynamic is clear from the beginning. Myra sees Jerry Lee as this sort of rock and roll god, idolizing him even after their blood relation is acknowledged. How are you? Well, I'm your daddy's cousin. I'm Jerry Lee Lewis from Faraday, Louisiana. To put it simply, Myra is a Jerry Lee Lewis fangirl, or at least becomes one rather quickly after he scores his record deal. Jerry Lee, on the other hand, is like, hmm, 2014 Justin Bieber in terms of maturity. Oh yeah, I forgot. Some of y'all might be too young to remember that. God, I'm getting old. Long story short, throughout 2014, pop sensation Justin Bieber had a lot of run-ins with the law, engaging in behavior from DUIs to assault to even vandalism. Just Google Justin Bieber legal issues and you'll be in for a hell of a ride. Jerry Lee Lewis was not arrested, but he had that same fuck it, I do what I want attitude. Not only does he flirt with his cousin whose dad is giving him a place to stay to form his band, but when he hadn't heard from the record company a few days after he sent in his mixtape or whatever the 50s equivalent was, he angrily drives away from the house, sulking that shit isn't going his way. Of course, right then, his first single plays on the radio and he behaves accordingly. God damn, Dennis Quaid kills it as Jerry Lee, making Billy her proud, I suppose. Jerry's immaturity is best exemplified by a small use of symbolism. Bubblegum! Throughout the film, Jerry Lee, a man-child, and Myra, a literal child, consume bubblegum, which was considered a childish habit at the time. This not only shows the clear emotional connection between Myra and Jerry Lee, but also that Jerry Lee's mindset is a place without any self-reflection or shame. When you're a teenager, usually, you think you're top shit and that you're never going to change and that everything will go your way. That's Jerry Lee for you. Now, this is not a justification for Jerry Lee's actions. It's disgusting, and the movie thinks so too. But I think this dynamic between Jerry Lee and Myra can be interpreted as the blurring of lines between creator and fan. We all go through a celebrity crush phase, spanning someone, perhaps a YouTuber or a musician or something of the like. You idolize them, seeing them as this perfect god or goddess, and imagine having a relationship with them, whether it be romantic, or sexual, or even both. Most of the time, nothing happens, and you move on without ever contacting your idol. And if you do, they either ignore your messages or turn you down, as they should. But there are those who cross the boundary and actively take advantage of their position to bed their fans, even minors. Austin Jones, Ian Watkins, whom I discussed back in 2019, Ryan Haywood, they all used their status to groom underage fans. These people looked up to them and they betrayed their trust. Jerry Lee not only abuses Myra's trust, but also her parents' trust by pursuing a relationship with her. She was his 
biggest fan and soon enough, his girlfriend. The movie initially presents this through rose-colored glasses. The world is revolving around Myra and Jerry Lee, and it seems that their love will triumph all. But the flaws in the relationship are there from the beginning. Quaid's obviously older-looking self contrasts well with Myra, who, again, is a young teenager. Myra's father, Jay, is suspicious of her relationship with Jerry Lee from the get-go, and this isn't shown as some mean old man who didn't understand true love. There's a scene early in the movie where Jerry Lee is obviously flirting with Myra and her friends, who are also minors, and it cuts to a disturbed Jay watching. <laughs> There's another scene where Jerry Lee, Myra, and her family are watching Five, a 1951 movie about the sole survivors of a nuclear war. Myra is horrified at it and holds on to Jerry Lee for comfort. Jay witnesses this and worries about her even after he goes to bed with his wife. Rightfully so! <laughs> but neither of these scenes show Jay as a strict parent. Both show him as a loving dad who doesn't want his daughter to be taken advantage of by her adult aged cousin. This dynamic leads us to... As we've established, Myra is a Jerry Lee Lewis stan. She loves him as much as a 13 year old can laugh, and she wants to be his forever wife. Now, back in my fandom days, and even after to some extent, I've seen fan fiction that allows you, the reader, to imagine yourself in a relationship with your celebrity crush. There's one that will always stick with me, a Markiplier fan fiction on DeviantArt. Now, I'm 11 years younger than Markiplier, but back in my Markiplier days, I'd imagine myself in these fan fictions as a cool young adult with the same body and personality as my 14 year old self. This fan fiction was different. In it, you, the reader, were indeed 11 years younger than Markiplier. You were friends with him, but one day, you were invited to a romantic cuddle with a tired Mark. I remember thinking at the time, oh, a little weird, but cute. But as an adult, it's totally creepy. It's creepy to imagine yourself in a relationship with a celebrity. That's parasocial. Here's what happens in real life if your shipping fanfiction comes true. After being pseudo-threatened by Jay to stay away from his daughter, Jerry Lee decides that marrying Myra is the best way to stay with her. Naturally, Myra is initially hesitant, but Jerry Lee tells her that his sister got married at 12, and that he's rich and famous and that he can give her the house waifu laifu of her dreams. And yes, this is insanely inappropriate and manipulative. But imagine yourself at 13 and you're hugely crushing on, um, who do 13 year olds fan these days? Um, Silver the Hedgehog? Yeah, Silver the Hedgehog, we'll go with that. You are 13 and you dream of being Silver the Hedgehog's waifu. You meet him one day in your hometown and you two hit it off. A romance quickly blossoms and soon, Silver the Hedgehog wants to marry you. You are 13, he is in his 20s. But you feel ready since you think Silver the Hedgehog is the love of your life. This makes Silver the Hedgehog a predator, even if he does love you. A 13 year old cannot reasonably consent to this type of relationship. And Silver the Hedgehog is already in enough trouble. He created Sonic 06. But you, the reader, see nothing wrong with this. I forgive you for your young and stupid. It doesn't take long for reality to hit the married couple. Kinda. Jay finds out about the marriage and actually takes it rather well. What are you doing? I'm going to go kill that son of a bitch. <laughs> Shut up! He then kicks Myra and Jerry Lee out. Myra packs up the last of her stuff in her pink dollhouse with a blue door. It's 
metaphorical given the fact that she's a literal child being taken away to a grown-up situation. Jerry Lee gives Myra the housewife life of her dreams, complete with a pink house with a blue door, just like the dollhouse! But Myra soon realizes that she's not ready to be a wife. She can't cook, and she has no idea how sex works. I mean, the fucking isn't realistic to begin with, but this... <laughs> is usually how young teenagers imagine sex. It's sure what I imagined sex was at 13. This whole marriage thing reads like Myra's own self-insert fanfiction. She, at 13, gets the guy of her dreams who seemingly loves her no matter what. There's even pointless relationship drama, just like the self-insert Swedish-American royal love story. This is on you, you son of a bitch. Not your father, not the press, and most definitely not Lucy. That's your coping mechanism, and it's a terrible one, and it's on you. It ain't a flower gothic production without making fun of the Swedes. But it doesn't take long before... The turning point of the film is Jerry Lee's infamous UK tour. As part of Myra's self-insert fantasy, Jerry Lee insists that she come with him, knowing full well of the risks. They might not understand about your marriage. You being so young and all. Now, the paper's over there saying that you could be the next king of rock and roll. But you gotta act accordingly. That's ironic, given that Elvis would soon groom a minor er, um, fall in love with a 14-year-old while in the army. So the record company gives in and they fly to- wait. Wait, that's a TWA plane. Wait, that's a- that, is that a lucky constellation? Connie? Is that you? Oh my god! Though those flight attendant uniforms aren't accurate. 50s TWA uniforms looked like this. Myra, being 13 and still in her fantasy world, immediately admits to a reporter that she's Jerry Lee's wife. The reporter takes this rather well. Is it true that you're married to this girl? When I first watched this scene, I thought Myra was an idiot for admitting that she was Jerry Lee's wife. But in the context of living out your fantasies, it kind of makes sense. What teenager wouldn't want to brag about a special relation they'd have with their celebrity crush? Teens brag all the goddamn time! This exact thing happened in Houston some years ago. Kind of. In 2005, middle school teacher Lance Mueller was caught having sexual relations with a 14-year-old former student of his. Naturally, he was fired, arrested, and registered as a sex offender. Eight years later, the student he had an affair with wrote her account of what happened, the other side of the story. I highly recommend you read it yourself, but I'll summarize the important bits. The student, whom we'll call Jenny, for that's the name she published the story under, talked about how Mueller was her media replacement for 8th grade U.S. history. He was 23 and rather attractive, which caused Jenny and her friends to grow intrigued by him, which was... Understandable, most middle school boys don't have the appearance or maturity of an adult. Now, this would have been relatively harmless were it not that Mueller returned Ginny's affections. Mueller took advantage of her obvious crush for his own sick desires, but as a young teen, Ginny thought it was true love, so much so that she bragged about it to her friends. The friends were weirded out and told their parents, who told her parents. And then reality ensued. What I'm trying to say here is that it makes sense that Myra would have talked. Myra probably didn't see herself as anything but a super mature 13 year old ready for marriage. But Jerry Lee groomed her, much like how Lance Mueller groomed Jenny. 
As the British press learn of Jerry Lee's marriage, the rose-colored world he and Myra shared collapses upon itself. It doesn't take long for Britons to learn that Myra is Jerry Lee's 13-year-old cousin wife. And he had a brilliant alibi too, goddamn! This is my little bride, Myra Gale Lewis. Myra but she Gale looks Lewis. so young! How old is she? Uh, uh she's 15. The revelation causes almost everybody to turn on him, which in turn destroys his rising career. The backlash is so bad, Jerry Lee has an onstage breakdown after he's jeered for being a baby snatcher at his first UK show. The tour was subsequently cancelled. People at Jerry Lee's record company even tried to get him to publicly apologize. And he takes it well. Who are you that walk in my house and tell me to apologize? You're making more off me than you ever made off Elvis. You all want Jerry Lee just to get down on his knees so you can go on getting your little piece of him? Man, I am Jerry Lee Lewis! I am the goddamn king! I have a God-given talent! And what the hell I got to apologize for? I married the girl I love. But alas... Reality ruined the marriage of Myra and Jerry Lee. The latter starts drinking and having affairs to cope with his lost stardom, and both break poor Myra's heart. The band doesn't do too well with Jerry Lee's breakdown either. They could only perform at local venues for small sums, and Jay eventually quits because of everything that happened. I don't blame him. He had to go through a lot in this movie. Jerry Lee eventually takes his frustrations out on Myra, physically and verbally assaulting her until he learns that she's pregnant, which finally makes him come to his senses and realize that he has fucked up. Thanks again! Yeah, I'm having a baby! I'm having a baby! Hello, Jerry. And this is what would happen in this day and age if a celebrity married an underage fan. It's disgusting and it heeds as a warning. This isn't necessarily the end of the film. The end scene involves a subplot I skipped over due to irrelevance. So for now, I'll give y'all... To all the young people who imagine themselves in relationships with celebrities, hear me out. I know I can't force you to stop having these feelings, and that's not my intent here. And hey, ain't nothing wrong with a little crush as long as it doesn't go too far. But actively pursuing your celebrity crush, writing self-insert fanfiction about dating them, or God forbid, trying to directly contact them, is unhealthy behavior. If the celebrity returns your affections, that's even worse. The line between creator and fan should never be crossed, even if you think it's true love. Look at what Jerry Lee Lewis did to Myra, the fan he crossed boundaries with. It's happened many, many more times since. Remember Call Me Carson or Onision? They, too, crossed boundaries with fans, and some of the people involved will never recover. So take Great Balls of Fire as a warning of what really happens when you go out with your celebrity crush. Good night, and see you next time.